Hello boys and girls, Uncle Night Shift again and welcome to another needlessly long video. Tonight we're gonna build a small scenic base slash vignette for this Sherman Easy 8 with additional concrete armor. This model has been the main focus on this channel over the past few weeks and to be fair, building a small countryside base for it was my plan from the beginning. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen my first attempt with this Syrian base in 172nd scale and looking back I'm quite surprised how smoothly everything went on that one. I'm not saying it to flex on you or anything, but it's gonna be an interesting comparison with this base where uh, I did several oopsies which I didn't expect to happen, but let's take it from the very start. So sit back, get a drink, maybe a snack if you feel extra fancy and let's do some modeling. My friends, this base begins the same way as the previous one, as a piece of insulating styrofoam. In this case I've already cut it into size, because I didn't want to subject you to any more safety hazards, but if you remember that clip from not so long ago... Yeah, it was pretty much like that. Now this piece of styrofoam is needlessly tall, so I had to cut it pretty much in half. And what's the best tool? Kitchen knife. Well, I quickly learned how tough styrofoam is, because if you try to slice it this way, it'll start packing up in the front of the blade, creating this indestructible wall of foam. <laughs> Looking back, this is where the problems began. The size and shape of the base wasn't the best. It could have been just a tiny bit larger, but I had to work with what I had. But it made me do a small investment for the future and I ordered a hot wire cutting table. Perfect 90 degree angles, smooth cuts and much more. Coming to this channel very soon, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, after I was sort of happy with the size I marked the position of the country road and got back to slicing. My idea is a dirt road with cattle fence on both sides so I'm keeping the edges slightly taller. I found a nice reference picture which I can't show but I've been loosely following it during both construction and painting. Ok, so the basic shape is there and now we can start modeling the terrain. I'll start with the road section and this time I'm gonna use air hardening modeling clay. It's a very popular medium amongst diorama modelers because it's cheap, soft and can be shaped into pretty much anything. I used it a long time ago when I was still trying to build terrains, like a decade ago, and I wasn't a big fan to be honest. No matter what I did in the past, the clay always cracked after it dried, we're talking like massive earthquake fissures in the ground. So I was a bit skeptical, but I tried to follow one advice I kept receiving over and over again. Keep the clay layer thin and you'll be fine. But you know, define thin. A millimeter? 5 millimeters? Well, you can get an idea from the video. Basically very thin, but thick enough so I could create some initial texture. That means track impressions. And here's another oopsie. Turns out impressing a finished tank into the ground isn't the easiest thing ever. I had to use the edge of the track as a stamp, which did the job, don't get me wrong, but at the same time there's no clearly defined tread pattern. This made me think. It's obviously best to have some sort of spare unused track that can be used for this purpose. Or I could have waited and glued the tracks to the model after the base was finished. Then it will be a lot easier than doing this, but you know, it's an experience for the future. Anyway, I also took the opportunity to make some ruts and this clay is perfect for that because it acts like... Uh, like clay. <laughs> and the results can be very interesting. I also added a few stones, which unfortunately won't be visible in the end, but you know, I tried. <laughs> now for some acrylic mud from Ammo. It's a glossy dark textured paint which is easy to spread and has a pretty nice texture. Heavier than the textured earth from Wilder that I normally use, but I like it a lot for the initial terrain layers. I applied it on both banks, which are gonna be covered with grass later. And I also blended the transition between the mud and clay using tap water. And after this I called it a night and left everything to dry until the next morning. 
So, the next morning I was pleasantly surprised because I didn't find any cracks in the clay, which is very exciting because this medium is truly amazing and I want to keep using it in my future terrains. So the next thing was to cover the road in a very thin layer of the same textured mud, and I mean a really thin layer. Just enough to make it look more gritty without covering up the track impressions and all the other fine details. I also tried spreading it on the sides of the base, because when it dries it's very tough, and I thought it may help to reinforce the styrofoam structure. I wiped away the excess, especially the small stones included in the mud, and when it dried I gave it another round of Mr. Surfacer 500. This is the same method like I used on the first base, and I honestly like both the process and the results. Unfortunately there were a few small kinks in this block of foam which I accidentally made while cutting it to size, so there was you know, no way of fixing them. But again, I think the hot wire cutting board will make mistakes like this a thing of the past. So the basic stuff is now done and we can start working on some more delicate stuff. Let's start with the… I don't know, a fence. I prepared a few strips of styrene. The brown ones are 1mm thick. The white ones 0.5mm. I'll use the beefier ones for poles and the smaller ones for planks. At first I had no idea how tall the fence should be, so I googled up some basic dimensions and fun fact, cattle fence is ideally 80cm tall and for example a goat fence is 1m. I didn't want to make it too short and look like 172nd scale compared to the very tall Sherman, so I've cut them into 2cm strips, which roughly translates into 1m tall fans. The wood grain texture was created with a razor saw. A steel wire brush would make it more random and the process would be faster, but I didn't want to shred my pristine white background or my fingers. <laughs> but yeah, it's a better method. <laughs> Here's a nice comparison between the untreated and textured pole. I also sharpened one end to make pushing them into the ground easier. And easy it was. That's the benefit of styrofoam and acrylic mud. They're quite flexible. Then I simply fixed them permanently with a small amount of super glue, and yeah, the spacing was roughly 2.5 centimeters. So that's gonna be the length of the smaller planks. This chopper. Yeah, it's actually called the Choppa, <laughs> and it's made by Northwest Shoreline in the US. And it made this process super fast and easy. I rarely use this tool, but on this project, I used it twice. First while well, building the concrete armor on the tank, and now with the fence. So, then I again textured every single plank. Yeah, this was just as boring as it looks. <laughs> and I attached them with Mr. Cement S in this zigzag fashion according to my reference picture. When all was said and done, I gave the entire fence a quick pass with the same liquid cement in order to smooth out the wood texture and eliminate any fuss created by the razor saw. Now we're ready for static grass and some natural debris. Following what I remember from the good old days, I dug up a bottle of wood glue, some static grass and earth from my garden. The white glue was diluted with a few drops of water and I brushed it in these random shapes on both slopes. This is where the real disaster begins, because from what I remember and what my buddy told me, sprinkling the static grass and then just, you know, blowing off the excess is more than enough to make a nice looking lawn. Well, as I was applying it, I wasn't very convinced, and blowing off the excess didn't bring any better results either. So I thought why not use the good old gravel and sand fixer. You know, like I would scatter some more grass on top of what I already had and then hold it all in place with the gravel fixer. This actually worked to some extent, but it left visible glue remains between several strands, so not very cool either. Anyway, I decided to continue and now I focused on making the transition between the grassy field and the road, so here I just sprinkled some earth followed by a few strands of dried sea ball. I actually added some in the center of the road, but here it's more of a heavily trampled grass which I'll blend with the terrain further. And again I fixed it with the same gravel fixer. Of course this time it worked like a dream, because that's what the thing is designed for. I also added a broken branch made from a root to make the empty corner more interesting. <laughs> and that's all I was able to think about. 
Anyway, moving on, I switched to my favorite textured earth from Wilder and brushed it over the central part of the road. Again heavily diluted with tap water and this blended the loose strands and debris, incorporating them into the terrain. One of my patrons advised me to make a natural scatter from dry leaves, so I gave it a shot. However, the result was very coarse. I ended up grinding them further between my fingers and it was only later when I thought about processing them even further in an old coffee grinder. We're so doing that next time. Anyway, this disaster is finally ready for painting and even though you can find an epic fail in every corner, it's not totally horrible. Oh, and it actually led me to ordering another fancy tool, a static grass applicator. So let's hope the next grassy terrain will look much better, fingers crossed. Ok, so let's start base coating with a combination of these Tamiya paints. Just like on the previous base, my top priority is to match the ground color with mud tones on the tank, so I'll be using pretty much the same colors. I think the best way to create nice damp mud effects is to start with dry earth tones and build the effect up in layers. I ended up airbrushing pretty much the entire base with this light tone because there are patches of dirt showing through the grass and it's gonna work as a primer for the wooden fence. Then I gave it a more random coat of deck tan and although this didn't have too big of an impact on the final product, it, you know, it gave me a good feeling that you know, I'm doing it the professional way. like. Like a cool kid. <laughs> the new XF89 German Olive Green is not only great for German tanks, but it's actually a nice dull grass color. However, it would be too monotonous and depressing, so I mixed it with some yellow green into this slightly happier green tone. This one was applied in a more patchy manner, and although the result wasn't bad, I'll have to go over the grass one more time later. You'll see why in a moment. So, with the main colors in place, it was time to put the airbrush aside for the time being and start with some detail painting. I decided to start with the fence, and remember how I mentioned ordering a wet palette a few weeks ago? Well, it arrived just in time, so I gave it a shot. A wet palette is basically a tray where you put a piece of sponge which is gonna hold water in it. Then you put some baking paper on top, which will absorb some of that moisture and it's gonna keep your acrylic paints workable for a very long time. But this is not the same thing as using paint drying retarder, which as the name suggests makes them dry at a slower rate. However, a wet palette will prevent them from drying fast on the palette and once you brush them on, they'll dry quickly as usual. So, as you probably already noticed, I painted the fence with grayish colors, again following some close-up reference shots. And that's actually a nice interesting detail. Faded old wood is not brown, but actually gray. Of course, I added a bit of old wood, Iraqi sand and deck tan into each layer to still, you know, retain some of that wooden appearance, if that makes any sense. And I finished it off with a glaze of old wood. We'll return to this later with some enamel paints, but for now the basic colors are done. I also took this opportunity to paint some of the visible stones in different tones of light grey, but it's a small detail that's gonna be barely visible, so it's not very important. Let's instead start with some weathering. Again, the first color is gonna be aquiline light mud, and the reason I said again is because I'm working with the same colors like I did on the tank. This color was used as the dry mud slash dust tone on the Sherman, so I wanted to make sure the dry tones will match. I also tried blending it over those occasional dirt patches in the grass, but this was quite difficult and I had to force the paint inside, so to say, with an airbrush. The result didn't look very good, so I had to give it another round of Tamiya paints. This time I started with pure yellow green for those bright happy grass tones, followed with XF89 in a very limited amount here and there. The grass was too dusty before, but this luckily did the trick. Now for some enamel dry mud tones. Again, the same color as before, and this one was just quickly speckled over the road, but most importantly on the side of the grass, where mud would be splashed by moving vehicles. This effect also helped to create a more natural color transition between the road and grass. 
And finally, the Dark Mud Zone. Again, the same I used on the tank, and this step was a lot of fun. I started by applying it basically as a dot filter, like you know, like the one we use on our models, where you place lots of oil paint dots on the surface and then blend them into a huge faded mess. And, and, and it's the same principle here, lots of mud colored dots, which I then blended with a lot of enamel thinner. This resulted in a nice uneven coverage with random darker spots surrounded with those which represent a more drying earth. Basically what I'm creating is not a soggy, wet soup-like muddy road, it's more of a, a hero dirt. If you're a mountain biker, you're probably familiar with the term hero dirt. It's, it's basically when the earth is still wet, but it's starting to dry, so it's not too muddy, it doesn't splash, doesn't stick to your wheels or shoes or whatever, but it's still rather dark and soft. So yeah, hero dirt. This enamel paint is also much easier to apply as a wash between the individual grass strands, and I was quite happy with the results after this treatment. It actually made the grass look rather presentable, even though it's growing in all directions and not, you know, up as it should. Again, I speckled the loose ground on the sides. This also works in conjunction with the previous dry mud spatters and creates a pretty nice effect. You can also notice how the road changed its color once the enamel thinner evaporated. And I also splashed it over the road. Compared to the previous dry mud speckling, I tried adding a lot more finer specks to give it that nice textured gritty appearance. And then I actually switched to a sort of dry brushing or dry stippling. Basically, I unloaded the brush on a napkin and then I stippled the thick enamel mud over the ruts to nicely distinguish them from the rest of the surface. This includes their sides, or banks, or what's the correct term, and also the central part, where it's super easy to highlight all the texture and track impressions we created with the modeling clay, and also slightly on the outside to gently blend the rut with the dry portion of the road. Here you can also see how the trampled grass and loose debris got integrated with the groundwork. And that's pretty much it for the terrain, so now we're just left with some finishing touches. So let's get back to the wooden fence and give it a very light enamel wash. Again, my favorite wash for a German dark yellow. It's a nice brownish tone, which isn't overly dark, and it actually has a very slight greenish tint, which also changes the color of the wood slightly, making it, you know, look more weathered, as if it's covered with a faint layer of moss. To add some extra detail, I grabbed a dark enamel rust stone and I painted small dots on every plank representing the corrosion coming from rusty nails. I carefully blended the edges with enamel thinner and if it was a bigger scene, like 135th scale, I'd most likely drill small holes in the wood for more detail, but in this scale I think this is actually quite okay. The sides of the base were painted with black Vallejo paint, same as on the T90 base, and I didn't dilute it too much with water, so one layer was actually enough. This can also nicely outline all the small undulations in the terrain, making the base look more detailed. Finally, we can attach the model to the ground. I used the same method like before, so I grabbed some textured earth, applied it to the tracks in huge amounts, and I pressed the model firmly against the base. I wanted to you know, squeeze some of that muddy paste out so it would fill the gap between tracks and the road, but I guess I didn't apply enough. Uh, I mean, at least it'll work as a glue, because when it dries, it's gonna be impossible to remove the model. So to fix the small gap, I simply applied it with a small brush and then carefully blended the edges. Gave it a few minutes to dry, and then I painted it with the same colors because we don't want this thin strip of mud to look different. I just simplified the process so I didn't use the Aqualine light mud, but went directly with the enamel dry tone from Ammo, followed with the loose ground. And I guess that's it ladies and gentlemen. To be honest with you, I'm not totally stoked about this dumpster fire of a base. I think the first one with the T90 came out much better. Um, beginner's luck, I guess. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not saying this base is awful or anything. I actually learned a lot from my mistakes. For example, composition. It's better to think twice about it before you commit. 
And in this case, the base could have been slightly bigger, so the model would have more breathing room around it. Also, the fence in the foreground wasn't the best idea ever, because it obscures most of the running gear, which is like the most interesting part of the tank when you're looking at it from ground level. Um, what else? Yeah, the grass. Like I said, I already ordered a static grass applicator, so hopefully next time we'll end up with nice, tall standing grass. And oh yeah, that hot wire cutting station. I'm very stoked about that one. And well, the previous base felt more original because it helped to convey a story around the tank. But I actually intended to create a very simple, you know, full vanilla base for this model. So no extra features, just a simple setting, not even to give it context. Just a plain, simple piece of terrain for the model to sit on it. Nothing more. I guess it serves its purpose, but at the same time, I kind of wish it was more... Yeah, just more. <laughs> Actually, a figure would be perfect, like a soldier standing in the corner waiting for the tank to pass along. But at this point, I still don't feel confident enough to paint figures. But don't worry, we'll get there eventually. I pinky freaking promise. Alright, so this concludes this Sherman Easy 8 project. Next week, I'll probably give you a tour of my workbench, and then we'll most likely build another 148 model. Again, with a scenic base. This time it'll be much more colorful than a simple drab military color, and I'm quite looking forward to it. Like I mentioned in my 100k video, it's summer as we speak, and I'd like to enjoy the warm weather outside, so we'll do one more quick project in 48 scale, and then we'll get back to something in 135th scale. So if you made it all the way to this point, then you deserve mad respect, my friend. There are also my amazing patrons who deserve a big thank you and respect, because their generosity makes this weekly show possible. If you'd like to get extra content like almost daily photo updates from my workbench, you'd for example know what I'm working on next and how's it looking so far, also one week early ad free videos so you could now watch the next episode, also very big and cool looking pictures like the ones you're seeing right now, which you can download and put them in your own night shift folder, then you might consider joining them if that's something you'd be interested in, and in return you'd help me a lot. So again, thank you for watching my friends, I hope you'll have a great weekend, stay awesome, keep building models, take care, be safe, give the video a like if you liked it or a dislike if you disliked it, subscribe if you're new here and want to see more content like this, and I'll catch you ladies and gentlemen in the next one, cheers!